PHY256, Introduction to Quantum Physics. So the website in the address listed here, this is where all the information about the course uh, is going to appear. So that includes uh, videos of the lectures, slides, lecture notes, uh, homework assignments, the syllabus, and any other information about the course. The lectures are gonna be on Zoom right here in this meeting room every Monday and Wednesday from 1 to 3 p.m. until June 15, and including June 15. The tutorials are after the lecture, so at 3 p.m. There's going to be a vacation on May 18, so that lecture and tutorial will be um, compensated for on June 15. The lectures and tutorials are going to be recorded and posted on Quercus. Um, but it's still important to attend the live lectures and tutorials. So I can see that we have 39 people right now. Um, two of those people are me. So 37 people is 10 people are missing from this lecture. Those 10 people are gonna have to watch the lecture, the recorded lecture, um, but they're not gonna be able to ask me questions during the lecture and they're not gonna be able to interact with me in any way. So I really recommend attending the live meetings. Um, yes, you do have a tutorial today in answer to the chat question. Uh, you have two tutorial groups. Uh, I sent you an email telling you who's in which group, but you can also see that on Quercus and those two TAs, each one of them has a different Zoom meeting ID. So you join um, that TA's meeting. The lectures, including this one, are gonna be posted on YouTube, but the student interactions are edited out. So right now you're just sending messages via chat and I'm not mentioning any names. So the questions you send are not gonna be on these YouTube videos. I'm just gonna read your question, but you're not gonna be identified. If you choose to speak via audio, or show me your video, that will just be cut out of the lectures. So don't worry about it. You will definitely not appear in any way in the lectures on YouTube. So you should feel, um, you shouldn't feel shy to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, there's two ways you can do it. You can unmute yourself and speak. So there's a button on the, bottom left and if you click on it it will unmute you and then you can talk or you can do what you've been doing so far and just send the group chat message and i will see that and answer your question so i'm the lecturer my name is barak shoshani i did my phd at perimeter institute um, which is in waterloo ontario it's an independent research institute for theoretical physics. My research interests include general relativity, quantum gravity, and scientific computing. My office hours are Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Zoom in this same, um, same meeting ID, same password. So feel free to drop by any time during those two hours and talk about whatever you want, whether it's a problem with the material or a general problem with the course itself or you're having some issues or whatever you want, anything I can help you with, you should feel free to drop by. Um, tomorrow there's not gonna be office hours because I imagine after just one day you probably won't need it, but at any time, you can email me at this address um, with any questions and I will make sure to answer your emails as soon as possible. Also, if you want, you can email me and ask to schedule one-on-one -on -one video chats. The TAs 
uh, Aaron Goldberg and Jyoti Moy Roy. And as I said, you should have received uh, an email telling you which group you're in. If you're not sure, you can also check it on Quercus. The lecture notes are gonna be on the website and they're going to contain all of the information that you need to succeed in this course. Um, there's no textbooks. I might mention some textbooks here and there for extra reading if you want, but they're not gonna be mandatory. The concept of this course as I designed it um, is that it's not a traditional quantum mechanics course. It's a course about, um, oh, in answer to the question on the chat, I actually, I'm going to post the lecture notes for basically the entire course, um, hopefully this week. So yeah, you will be able to even read ahead if you want before the next lectures. In this course, I'm going to be teaching you quantum theory from a modern 21st century point of view. So this is the same way that researchers in physics uh, see quantum theory. That is how I'm going to teach it to you. It's going to be an axiomatic development of the theory from scratch, which is going to be more or less mathematically rigorous. So I believe that by doing that, you will get a much better intuition um, about how the theory works than if I just give you some equations and I don't explain where they're coming from. There's going to be emphasis on deep conceptual understanding of the material, not on calculations. You'll do some calculations, but the main thing I want you to get from this is the conceptual understanding of quantum mechanics. Uh, so the goals of the course are to develop intuition for quantum physics. Um, quantum physics is very different from classical physics. Classical physics is more or less intuitive. It matches our day-to-day -day experience. Um, but quantum physics is very unintuitive. However, I do believe that you can develop very good intuition for it if you do it correctly. Also, when you finish this course, uh, you will be prepared for more advanced courses or research that involves quantum mechanics. So here's the syllabus for the course. We're gonna start with the failures of classical mechanics and compare quantum and classical mechanics to see what the main differences are. This we're going to, uh, I believe we're going to finish this today. And then we're going to go right into the mathematical background, complex numbers, linear algebra, and probability. We're gonna be doing that probably for the first two weeks or so. And even if you have learned these subjects in the past, I still want you to attend those lectures and do the homework because we're going to be using notation that is unique to quantum mechanics that you have not seen in any uh, linear algebra course. And we're going to learn specific things about complex numbers, linear algebra and probability that are relevant to quantum mechanics. Once we're done with the mathematical background, we're going to start with an axiomatical definition of quantum theory. And when we do that, we're going to define and explain all of these different concepts that you may have heard of before, such as Hilbert spaces, states, operators, observables, superposition, probability amplitudes, expectation values, and so on. Next, in the second half of this course, we're going to study discrete systems and we're gonna do that using the simplest discrete system there is, which is a qubit, which is basically the quantum analog of a classical bit that can be zero or one. So a qubit can be in a superposition of zero and one, and we're going to learn what that means. Using these discrete systems, we're gonna talk about 
uh, Schrodinger's cat, quantum entanglement, Bell's inequality, the uncertainty principle, unitary evolution, quantum measurements, quantum teleportation, and other cool things. Then we're going to move to continuous systems, which are more complicated and will require some calculus. We're going to be talking mainly about particles. We're going to learn about Hamiltonians, the Schrodinger equation, the quantum harmonic oscillator, wave functions, the wave particle duality, quantum interference, and scattering and tunneling in one dimension, and some other stuff. If we have time after going through all of those things, we're going to talk about some advanced topics, such as canonical quantization, path integrals, quantum algorithms, particle physics, quantum field theory, and maybe even quantum gravity. Okay, so for homework, assessments, and grading, there's going to be six weekly homework assignments. And this assignment is just going to be pass or fail. A pass gives you 3% of your final grade. Collaboration on homework is allowed, but only with other students in this course. If you do collaborate, you have to write who you collaborated with on which problems and what kind of contribution each of these people did. There's going to be a midterm oral assessment. So it's going to be a one on one video chat with me in the last 10 minutes. The threshold to get a pass, uh, I'm getting a question here on the chat. It's uh, all you need to do is you need to show me that you made an honest attempt to solve all the questions. You don't actually need to get the correct answers. So in the oral assessment, the midterm is going to be 10 minutes, just you and me. It's going to be conceptual questions, just to see that you understand the material, and maybe some short calculations. I might ask you to write down some equations or do a quick calculation on a piece of paper. Uh, but it's only 10 minutes, so there's not going to be any long calculations. And this counts as 22% of the final grade. The midterm also serves to prepare you for the final oral assessment, which is again a one-on-one -on -one video chat with me. It's going to last 15 minutes. It's also going to have conceptual questions and short calculations, and it's going to count as 60% of your final grade. Okay, um, so let's get started with the actual material. And we're going to talk about the failures of classical physics. I'm going to start with black body radiation and the ultraviolet catastrophe. So a black body is an object that absorbs all incoming light, or more generally, all electromagnetic radiation. It doesn't only absorb light, it also emits light or radiation, and it has a spectrum of wavelengths with the radiation being at a different level at different wavelengths. If you try to use classical physics to try to predict how much radiation is going to be um, output at each wavelength, so here uh, this is the wavelength, and this axis is a spectral radiance, which is a fancy way to measure how much radiation there is. If you try to use classical physics to calculate this spectrum, it turns out that the amount of radiation is predicted to be inversely proportional to the wavelength. So what does that mean? It means that as the wavelength approaches zero, the amount of radiation approaches infinity. So here this black line is the prediction, the classical prediction, and you can see that it keeps going up and up and going to infinity. It's actually going out of the plot. This is called the ultraviolet catastrophe because the ultraviolet is the wavelength that are shorter than visible light. 
obviously this does not match the experimental uh, results because when we measure the total energy that the black body outputs, it's definitely not infinity. It is some finite number. So this seems to be a problem with classical physics. And indeed, to solve it, you must use quantum physics. So what we do is we assume that radiation can only be emitted in discrete packets of energy called quanta. Instead of, in the classical theory, radiation being this continuous wave, in the quantum theory, you just get packets of energy called quanta. If you do this, you can calculate how much radiation you get at each wavelength. And this is called Planck's law. And you can see it here. So these three curves show you the spectrum of radiation uh, for 3000 Kelvin, 4000 Kelvin, and 5000 Kelvin. And of course, as the temperature increases, you get more radiation, but you definitely don't get infinite radiation. And this actually does match what you get when you do an experiment to measure the radiation. These packets of electromagnetic energy are called photons. So let's go to another experiment, the photoelectric effect. When light hits a material, which usually you take to be a metal, but it doesn't have to be, it causes the material to emit electrons. So the light somehow dislodges the electrons from the atoms that make the material. And these electrons are emitted from the material. This is called the photoelectric effect. Now, using classical physics and the assumption that light is a wave, we can make the following predictions. First of all, brighter light should have more energy, so it should cause the emitted electrons to have more kinetic energy, and therefore they should be moving faster. In other words, speed, the speed of the electrons, should be proportional to brightness of the incoming light. Now, light at higher frequency should hit the material more often, or the crest should hit more often, so it should cause a higher rate of electron emission, and therefore, if you measure the current generated by these electrons, you will find a larger current. So the current, the electric current, should be proportional to the frequency. And you can see here that red light has a low frequency, so the crests only hit the material three times. But here, blue light has a much higher frequency, so there's a lot more crests to hit the material. So it makes sense. Also, assuming there is a certain minimum energy that's needed to dislodge an electron from the atom, and since brightness correlates with energy, then there should be some threshold of brightness such that if the light is dim, the electron is not released, and as the brightness exceeds this threshold, the electron will be released. Okay, so this is the classical prediction. However, in reality, when you actually do this experiment, you find the exact opposite. You find that the speed of the emitted electrons is actually proportional to the frequency of the light, and the current of the generated by the electrons is proportional to the brightness of the light. And you also find that this threshold, such that below the threshold there are no electrons and above the threshold there are electrons, is actually a frequency threshold. Only light that exceeds a certain frequency will cause the electrons to be emitted. So you can see this illustrated here. 
So the red light has a low frequency and it's below the frequency threshold. That means that no electrons are being released. It doesn't matter how bright the red light is. It can be as bright as the sun, but it still will not cause any electrons to be emitted. Now the green light has a higher frequency, so it is beyond the threshold, and it does cause electrons to be emitted, but with a small spin. The blue light has a much higher frequency, so it causes the electrons to be emitted with a much larger speed. Now again, this blue light, it doesn't have to be bright. You can actually shine a very dim light, and that will still be enough to release the electrons. So, how to explain this? Well, we have to use the same concept we used before of photons. So to take the energy of the photon to be proportional to the frequency of the light and the number of photons to be proportional to the brightness. So that means that here there's low frequency. So each individual photon making up this light is going to have a small amount of energy. If you make this light really, really bright, it's not going to increase the energy of the individual photons. It's just going to have more photons, but each photon individually is still not gonna have enough energy to cause electrons to be emitted. Here, there is a high frequency light. So the photons, each one of them has a high energy, and even if it's very dim, it just means that there are not too many photons, but still, even if there's 100 photons and not a trillion, each one of those 100 photons potentially has enough energy to cause an electron to be emitted. Okay, so the question is, in terms of the brightness, uh, would the higher brightness cause a higher amount of electrons ejected? Um, it will cause the electrons to be released with a higher rate. So the current, uh, which you can measure, is actually proportional to the brightness. The electrons will still be emitted with the same kinetic energy. It's just that if you make the light brighter, you're going to have more photons. So then um, they're going to hit the electrons more frequently, and the electrons are going to be released more frequently, causing a higher current. So now we move to the double slit experiment. So the previous two experiments maybe convinced you that light is actually not a wave, but a particle. Light is made of photons and we know how they behave and that's it. But the double slit experiment may convince you otherwise, or at least it will convince you that light is more complicated than you think. In this experiment, there is a light beam that hits a plate over here. Most of the light is blocked by the plate, but the plate also has two narrow slits. And the light does go through those slits. And then it hits a screen on the other side of this plate. And on this plate, when you do this experiment, you will find a pattern of bright bands and dark bands. The most natural way to explain this pattern is that light is actually a wave. So then what happens is that each of those slits becomes the beginning of a new wave. So you can see here there's one wave going from this slit and one wave going from this slit. And at some point, those two waves meet and interfere with each other. So how does that work? So the waves have crests and troughs. So here are the crests. And the troughs are the ones on the bottom. 
so this is the first wave and then below is the second wave and on top is the total of the two waves so if two waves have a crest at the same place that will add up into a crest that is double the size this is called constructive interference if one wave has a crest and then the other wave at the same place has a trough they will also add up but since this one is negative they will cancel each other so the result is going to be that there is no light at that point this is called destructive interference and this pattern on the screen you can actually do the calculation and find that indeed when two waves emitted by two slits interfere in this way this is exactly what you will get the bright bands are the ones where there's constructive interference and then the dark bands are where there is destructive interference it seems like the double slit experiment proves that light is actually a wave and contradicts the previous two experiments it turns out actually that both are correct or more precisely that the quantum nature of light has this consequence that sometimes it behaves like something that we interpret as a classical wave and other time it behaves uh, like something that we interpret as a classical particle this is called the wave particle duality. I think there is a common misconception about what wave particle duality actually means. It doesn't mean that the light is both a wave and a particle at the same time in some mysterious way. It just demonstrates that the classical concepts of wave and particle are just not the proper way to describe reality. Yeah, what's your question? What does the amplitude of light represent? So, of course, with the photons, it represents that there are more photons. Um, and here you can think about it just as brightness. So when there is constructive interference, the amplitude is bigger, and that's why you have brighter areas. And when there's destructive interference, then there's no brightness, so you have a dark area. Okay, I have another question here. If only one single quantum of light is sent through the slit, would we see an interference pattern? Um, yeah, so this is actually what I'm going to talk about next. So it seems like the double slit experiment proves that light is a wave and proves that there's wave particle duality. But you can ask, what about matter? I mean, light is not a very tangible thing anyway so i can you can maybe say i accept that it can be a wave and a particle or both of them can be different aspects of it but what about matter i mean the atoms we are made of certainly they are tangible things you can touch and they don't behave like waves well okay we can do an experiment to check that so instead of sending photons, we now send a stream of electrons into this plate. If we think electrons are particles and not waves, we expect to find on this screen not an interference pattern, but just individual dots that correspond to individual particles hitting the screen. And indeed, this is what happens if you look here and I hope you can see this. You can see that there are individual dots randomly placed around the screen. Each one corresponds to one electron hitting the screen. So you can stop there and say, good, electrons are particles. But if you leave the experiment going for some time, more points are going to start accumulating on the screen over time. And after a while, you're going to see that these dots actually now create 
an interference pattern. And you can see this very clearly here. So there are bright bands and there are dark bands created by different particles hitting the screen at different times. Oh, and for your question, yes, you can do this also with a single photon, but it's kind of more impressive when you do it with a single electron, especially because our intuition tells us that an electron must be a particle, and our intuition doesn't tell us that light must be a particle. So, what does this mean? It means that in quantum physics, both light and matter exhibit wave particle duality. In classical physics, the measurement of the position of the electron on the screen is deterministic. If we know the initial position and velocity of the electron, then we can predict exactly where the electron lands on the screen. But in quantum physics, what we have instead is a probability distribution. So a distribution or a function that gives us the probability for the electron to be measured at each particular point on the screen. This probability distribution turns out to propagate in space, so between the plate and the screen, just like a wave propagates. And when this probability distribution propagates, it also interferes with itself constructively and destructively in exactly the same way that the wave does. And this is what causes this interference pattern on the screen, even for individual electrons. It's actually a pattern of probabilities, showing me the probability distribution at the screen. So the probability will be enlarged in the bright areas because of constructive interference, and it will be reduced in the dark areas because of destructive interference. Um, okay, I see here another question. Um, with light, is there in principle a part of the interference pattern with no light? Presumably we could draw a vertical line down on the screen at regular intervals where the line would pass through no light. If so, in the single electron test, is there in principle part of the pattern where no electrons impact the screen? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think if you do the calculation precisely, you should find an answer to that. There probably is like a single line maybe where the probability is exactly zero, but you have to remember that a single line has no meaning in reality because things have a width and the single line doesn't have a width. So I'm not sure exactly how that would work. I think if you run this for enough time, or oh, maybe an infinite amount of time, probably every single point on the screen will at some point uh, see an electron hit it. Uh, but again, I will have to do the actual calculation and see if there are actually any regions where there is zero probability. Okay, any other questions? Question, does this mean electrons have wave particle duality? Yes. In fact, any particle and atom and molecule has wave particle duality to some extent. You can actually do this experiment not just with electrons, you can do it with atoms, you can do it with molecules. I think the largest molecule that did this experiment with is a molecule of, uh, of 60 carbon atoms, and still they showed there was an interference pattern. Um, another question. Since electrons have fields, is it not possible that the fields interact to create a potential field that aligns with a wave's interference pattern on the screen? Well, not really. I mean, the, the field of the electron, if you just send one electron in classical physics, including the electric field that is caused by the electron, you can still deterministically calculate exactly where it's going to land. What happens here is different from an electric field 
what happens here is that there is actually a probability wave and that is causing this interference pattern. It actually doesn't require any electromagnetism. You can do this also with mutual particles and get the same result. Um, any other questions? Is there a threshold that some mass the wave particle gravity disappears? Um, it's a good question. I think people are still testing it, uh, but one thing you need to keep in mind is that there isn't like a, a hard threshold. It's just that everything is quantum, but when things are big enough, you can approximate their behavior with classical mechanics. And we're gonna talk about that soon. People have tried this experiment with pretty big molecules. Obviously, if you try it with, I don't know, like a, a billiard ball, you're not gonna get this result. So it's hard to tell exactly where the threshold is. And there could be just different magnitudes of this interference that kind of, uh, you get less and less interference, the bigger the thing is sent through the slits is. Question, after the electron lands, does it repel other electrons? This screen over here, um, if I'm not mistaken, and I, by the way, I'm a theorist, not an experimentalist, so I'm not exactly the person to ask about the intricate details of these experiments but I believe this screen is just a screen that absorbs the electrons and once the electron hits the screen it creates this white dot and that's all there is. So I don't believe that electrons will um, repel each other once they've already hit the screen. Question, what is it about size that makes it adhere more to classical predictions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the common wisdom is that when you have one quantum system, like an elementary system, like one particle, that behaves according to quantum mechanics. And then when you add up lots of these small quantum systems into one big quantum system, the more small systems you have in that big system, the better the classical approximation works. And the reason is that they kind of cancel each other, but even a whole planet made out of trillions upon trillions upon trillions of particles, it too behaves according to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the theory that explains how everything behaves. It's just that you can approximate it with classical mechanics under certain conditions. It's similar to how special relativity is the theory that explains how everything works uh, in the absence of gravity, but you only really need it if you have fast velocities that are close to the speed of light. If you just have something moving at five kilometers per hour, special relativity still describes it, but you don't need to use it because the Newtonian approximation is enough to describe something moving at five kilometers per hour. I see the question, is it possible to create an interference pattern with a single electron? No, because uh, you send a single electron, then you just get one point somewhere. You won't get a pattern. To see the pattern, you have to send lots of different electrons. And basically what you're doing is really, you're making a measurement of the probability distribution of the electron. So it's like, if you had a six-sided die, but one side, when it is weighted so that six comes out more often, and you wanna check that, if you just roll the die once, you're not gonna be able to see that. You're gonna to need to roll the die a thousand times and write down the result each time, and then you can see, oh, wait, six appears half of the times, which should appear 
one six of the times, this die must be loaded, but you can't see that if you just roll the die once. Okay, so let me just uh, say kind of as, a, as an aside that in 21st century terms, the answer to the question, is light a wave or a particle, turns out to be that both of them are different aspects of the same fundamental entity called the quantum electromagnetic field. So there's a field that is kind of the quantum version of the classical electromagnetic field. This field propagates from place to place like a wave. But on the other hand, if you put enough energy into it, you can cause a quantum excitation in this field, which we will learn about later. And this excitation is what actually behaves like a particle. In fact, it turns out that all elementary particles are quantum fields. So all of them exhibit these two aspects. And this is called quantum field theory. It's the theory that unites quantum mechanics with special relativity. And it explains elementary particle physics in amazing accuracy. In fact, it is the most accurate theory in all of science. But we won't talk about it in this course. If you go to grad school, you may learn it there. Okay, the last experiment I want to talk about is the stern gerlach experiment. In this experiment, you have particles coming out of here and going through an inhomogeneous magnetic field over here. Now, for reasons that we won't go into, because they require some advanced knowledge of electrodynamics, this magnetic field will deflect the particle up or down by an amount proportional to its angular momentum. So in classical physics, the angular momentum of the particle can have any value. And therefore we expect that the deflected particles will create a line on the screen. So the middle of the line is where the particle does not have any angular momentum and therefore it's not deflected. Now if it has angular momentum, uh, let's say clockwise, it will be deflected up by how much angular momentum it has. And if it has angular momentum in the opposite direction, it will be deflected down by that amount. So again, just like in the other cases I showed you, the prediction of classical physics fails. And what we actually see is that the particles are deflected. First of all, they are always deflected. And also, they only deflect to two points, one point here and another here. So one point up, one point down, and nowhere else. So basically, it looks like they can only have one of two very specific values of angular momentum that are the opposites of each other. To explain this result, again, we need to throw away classical physics, because in classical physics, particles are classically spinning objects that can have angular momentum. But in quantum physics, there's something else called spin, which is a type of intrinsic angular momentum. For particles like electrons or silver atoms, for example, a measurement of spin only yields one of two values. And we call those values, uh, I guess because of this experiment, we call them spin up and spin down. So if a particle has spin up, it will end up here. Spin down, it will end up here. So the previous experiments, they all showed us that something continuous, such as light, is quantized into discrete quanta, in the case of light, that are called photons. And similarly, 
the stern Gerlach experiment tells us that there's another continuous thing, angular momentum, which is also quantized into discrete spin. Okay, I have a question. What does spin physically represent? Is it just angular momentum or is there more? This is the type of question that I hope that after I teach you all the math, you will understand. So right now, since this is a non-technical introduction where I haven't really introduced you to the whole formalism, it's very hard to explain exactly what is it and why does it only have two values. But in a few weeks, I think you will understand the answer to your question. Another question. So all atoms are spinning at the same rotational frequency, just either in one direction or the other? Well, not exactly. So as we will learn soon, when you make a measurement, that is when um, the result of the measurement is decided randomly. So there's no accurate way to say that okay, this is spinning right now in this direction. You only know that after you make the measurement. And then when you make the measurement of the spin, you will see that it ends up to be one of those two options randomly. I know this is unintuitive, but that's exactly what quantum mechanics is. It is unintuitive, and I hope that in a few weeks you will understand this much better. Another question. Does every particle have intrinsic spin? Basically, so all particles have spin, but some particles have spin zero, which I guess means they don't have spin, uh, but there's not a lot of those. So for example, electrons and quarks have spin one half. So it means the value of the spin that we measure in some units is one half, plus or minus one half. And for example, photons have spin one, and gravitons have spin two, and Higgs bosons have spin zero. And if we get in the end to particle physics, which I hope we will, then we will talk about that in more details. I have another question here. Can a particle's spin change? No, at least not if it's an elementary particle. Elementary particles like electrons have a set spin that can never change. So if electron has a spin one half, it will always have spin one half. Oh, more precisely, all the electrons have spin one half by definition. Of course, if you have some composite particle that's made of several different particles with different spins, then the spin of the composite particle is determined by combining all those spins together, and if you take one particle out, then the spin of the composite particle is going to change. So I have a question on the chat. Has there been any experiment showing particles can only be at one of these spins versus the particles just being stable at one of these spins? So there is the, a theory that explains what is the spin of each particle and that theory is quantum field theory and every single experiment we have done has proven that theory to be correct so from that we learn that most likely that theory is correct at least as far as we've been able to test it and that theory says that all electrons have spin one half which means that if you measure the spin you will always get one of two options plus one half if it's spin up, or minus one half if it's spin down. Question, I don't really understand how we define the direction of spin, like with different orientation, why does it only spin up, down, but not left, right, or front, back? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not gonna answer it right now because I, I need to actually introduce you to the real meaning of spin using the math, which I just can't, if I just use words. So you'll have to be patient. And once we learn all the relevant math, you will understand what that means. Let me just mention that we can use this property 
this mysterious property that we don't really understand right now and we will understand better later. Uh, but we can use it to create qubits, which are quantum bits that I mentioned before. And uh, will, for example, spin up can represent zero on the bit and spin down represents one. So because spin is a quantum thing, it's a quantum quantity that obeys the rules of quantum mechanics and allows for stuff like superposition and entanglement and all those things that we'll talk about soon, then we can take advantage of those quantum properties and potentially build a quantum computer using qubits that does calculations faster than a classical computer that uses classical bits that don't have these quantum properties. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. And I wanna to talk to you now about quantum versus classical mechanics. So what are really the main differences? First of all, as far as we know, quantum mechanics is the fundamental theory of reality. Now, it could be that maybe there is a theory more fundamental than quantum mechanics, but so far we haven't seen anything like that. Classical mechanics, like I mentioned before, is just an approximation to that theory, that we can take that approximation in certain situations. This means also that in general, all modern physics theories must be quantum theories if they intend to be fundamental. If you make a theory of physics that you want it to be a fundamental theory of reality that doesn't depend on, that is not an approximation to any other theory, then it has to be a quantum theory because quantum theory is the way to describe fundamental physics. There is one important exception to that rule um, that is general relativity. We don't really know how to describe general relativity using quantum mechanics, even though we can, we can do special relativity. If we could do that, that would be called quantum gravity. And that is one of my research areas, and hopefully I will be able to talk about it at the end of this course. But usually this is not actually a problem because um, like we said before, big things generally can be described classically and general relativity generally uh, only talks about big things like planets and stars and galaxies and so on. So this does lead us to the, this next line. Quantum mechanics describes small things and classical mechanics describes big things. So we already talked about that before, actually. But here we have some scales. So there's a proton is really in the quantum regime. Actually, there's also smaller things like electrons. And there is an atomic nucleus, also quantum. And there's an atom, also quantum. Here there's a buckyball, which is a molecule of 60 carbon atoms, um, which is, as I said, it has been tested in the double slit experiment and people found that it does actually have interference. Now, here we have, in the classical side, we have a person, a cat, a computer chip, a human hair, and a dust speck. All of those things are big enough that even though they are still described by quantum mechanics in principle. In practice, you could just approximate them using classical mechanics, at least in the mechanics side. There may be things inside the computer chip that actually use quantum effects to work. Here we have this coronavirus, which is kind of in the middle. So I don't really know if people have tested to see if viruses can have quantum effects like interference, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. And the last property on this page is that quantum mechanics is discrete and classical mechanics is 
continuous. So as we saw, sometimes, in fact, almost all the time, but not all the time, things that are continuous in classical mechanics become discrete in quantum mechanics. So the continuous electromagnetic field, classical field, becomes made of discrete photons. Continuous angular momentum is replaced with discrete spin, and so on. So, there's three more important differences. First of all, classical mechanics is deterministic, and quantum mechanics works on probability. Oh, I have a question here. Not every aspect is discrete though, right? Yes, depending on the quantum system, uh, you can have, for example, if it's just a free particle moving around, then its position is going to be continuous. As you can actually see in this illustration, which I will now explain. So in classical mechanics, we can know the exact position and momentum of a particle deterministically. If we know it at one time, we can then predict the position momentum at any other time. In quantum mechanics, we only know the probability distribution to find the particle at a certain position or with a certain momentum. So this is the probability distribution for position, and you can see that it is kind of centered around the classical value of zero. So here, this is just a one-dimensional system. The particle moves along this line. It's currently classically, if it was classical mechanics, would be located at zero. But in quantum mechanics, there is actually a probability distribution that tells me the probability to get the particle at each particular position. So there's a certain probability for it to be here at zero, but also another probability for it to be over here, and it can be anywhere within this probability distribution. Similarly for the momentum. The momentum, again, is centered on the classical uh, value, because that's, that's how it chose to define it, but the momentum can be really at any point within this probability distribution with different probabilities. The other thing is that quantum mechanics allows for superposition of states. Well, classical mechanics has just one state. So in classical mechanics, the state of the particle is just gonna be this position and this momentum. But in quantum mechanics, there is superposition, which means that the quantum particle is in a superposition of being at all these different places and also in a superposition of being at all these different momenta. Um, and by the way, here you can see that uh, what I told you before, that the particle's position is not discrete. It can be anywhere along the real line, really. I mean, here it looks like the probability is zero, but really it can't be zero because it has to be continuous. So it has a very small but non-zero probability to be even here at two. Or anywhere outside this line. So the position and momentum of a particle are continuous and not discrete. Finally, we have uncertainty. So quantum mechanics has the uncertainty principle and classical mechanics doesn't have that. So I have a question here. Doesn't the probability have to equal one though? Of what? Oh, you mean like the, the integral over the probability distribution, is that what you mean? Yes, it is one. So this is a normal distribution, which we'll learn about probably in a few lectures. It goes down to zero, it's, it's, never, it's never zero, but it goes down to zero fast enough that if you integrate it from minus infinity to plus infinity, the result is exactly one, as it has to be, like every probability distribution. In classical mechanics, at least in principle, we can know precisely both the position and momentum with 100% accuracy. 
It only depends on how precise our measurement devices are. But this is, of course, assuming that classical mechanics is true. In quantum mechanics, what we know is actually that the more we know about the position, the less we know about the momentum and vice versa. So let's look at this example. The probability distribution of the position is very narrow. So I'm pretty sure that pos the position of the particle is somewhere in this relatively small area. However, if you then, if you have this distribution for the position and then you try to calculate the probability distribution for the momentum, you will find this distribution. Well, now you can see that it's not narrow, it's actually pretty wide. And the momentum can be anywhere within this much larger area. So there is this rule that follows from quantum mechanics and we will prove it. And it tells you that if the uncertainty in position is low, such as here, then the uncertainty in the momentum has to be high, like here. The last thing we have is um, quantum entanglement, which is illustrated by this uh, photo. <laughs> so in classical mechanics, we can have definitely correlation between different measurements. Let me give you an example. I have two notes. I write zero on one note and I write one on the other note. And then I put them in sealed envelopes and I give one to Alice and one to Bob. And then they both go home and Alice opens her envelope and she sees the note says zero. So she can know for certain that Bob's envelope contains the note that says one. And she knows that because there is a classical correlation between these two measurements. Quantum mechanics has quantum entanglement, which is a stronger version of correlation. So if I do the same, but instead of notes that say zero, one, I use qubits, which are in a superposition of zero and one. And still, if Alice measures her qubit and finds zero, she will know that Bob's qubit will be one. But quantum entanglement is a stronger correlation because uh, as, you can, as you will see in the rest of the course, you can actually do a lot more with it than you can do with just classical correlation. So in fact, we will see not only that it is a stronger version in a proven way of correlation, but also that quantum entanglement can be used for very cool uh, things like quantum cryptography and quantum computing. And using it allows you, it's kind of like a resource that you can use to make more powerful algorithms than you could do with just a classical correlation. Okay, so I have a question in the chat. Is there any way to make two particles entangle? Um, yeah, so for example, if I have some process that creates two particles and then the total angular momentum is zero before the particles are created, then after the two particles are created, they have to have opposite angular momentum. In other words, they will have opposite spin. So you can see this actually in this photo here, or illustration. So this particle will have spin up, and this particle will have spin down, because the total spin of both of them, if you add them up, has to be zero, because it's conserved. Any more questions? Yes, what's the question? So the question is, uh, entanglement does not relate with distance. Um, that's right. So, I mean, it has nothing to do with distance. So just like with the envelopes, Alice could go to the Andromeda galaxy and Bob can stay on Earth and they both measure or open the envelopes and see zero or one. 
they know the results are entangled, even though they are at a distance of, I don't know, billions of light years away. So this actually works both for classical and quantum correlation. So there is a question, does entanglement exist for all time or does it expire? I mean, uh, it doesn't just randomly expire, but of course it is very fragile because as soon as you measure the particle, which also means just interacting with the particle in any way, you destroy the entanglement. So in other words, these envelopes have to be completely isolated and protected against any kind of interaction with what's inside the envelopes if you want to keep the entanglement. Uh, okay, I have a question here. Can particles have different strengths of entanglement? Uh, that's a good question. The answer is, is no, because uh, Entanglement is just, it's a correlation between the measurements of two quantum systems. So the correlation always exists. And I, I'm not sure there's any way in which it can be. So the quantum entanglement is definitely a stronger type of correlation than classical correlation, uh, but it is what it is. It doesn't have different levels. Actually, people are doing research on potentially theories that have even stronger correlations. And there's like this whole spectrum of correlations. It starts in classical, goes through quantum, and then goes to even stronger correlations. But of course, those are just theories that are actually kind of a modifications of quantum mechanics that are not actually how the world works. Uh, so the question is, what would stronger or weaker correlations indicate? In uh, probably about two weeks, we're going to learn about Bell's inequality. And when we do that, you will see actually a numeric way in which you can tell how much a correlation, how strong a correlation is. So it's a certain inequality that is supposed to be true for classical correlations. And then you can show that if you have quantum entanglement, you can violate that inequality. Okay, we have another question. In general, if you have entangled particles and you apply some transformation to one of them, say you do something to change the polarization of a photon that is part of a polarization entangled pair, would that break the entanglement? Or would we see the transformation somehow reflected in the other member of the entangled pair? Um, it's a good question. And uh, when we talk about quantum teleportation, I will give you an answer to that question once we have the actual tools to do that. So there is something like that that happens in quantum teleportation, where you actually apply some modifications to the qubits that you have in order to teleport one of the qubits. Okay, so I have another question. Can more than two particles entangle each other? You can definitely create a system of as many particles as you want that are in an entangled state. So question, does that mean we can use entanglement to send information? Uh, definitely not. So this is a common misconception. So people think that because if Alice measures her qubit and finds zero, then she knows Bob will have one. Somehow that means that the two qubits communicated with each other. And if Bob is at the Andromeda galaxy, then that means the communication was faster than light. But actually, um, it doesn't work that way because you can't decide what you measure. It's like if you could decide that you're going to measure zero so that Bob would then measure one and then use that to send Bob a message in binary, then that would have allowed you to send information, whether faster than light or not faster than light. But you can't choose what you measure, it's just random. So it's really, in terms of sending information, not any different than the envelopes. When you open the envelope, 
and you find a zero on the note inside the envelope, that's what you have. You know, now you have the information that Bob has one in his envelope, but you didn't actually send him any information. You just opened the envelope and saw what you got. You couldn't, you can't control it and somehow make it be one if it is actually zero. So even though quantum entanglement is stronger than classical correlation, it's still, it's not a means to send information. It's just still a correlation. So the question now is, so the spin of the particle cannot be changed. Well, the thing is that it can be one of two options. And when you measure it, there's a certain probability to get one and a certain probability to get the other. That's all you can do. So I have another question here. How would you know that two particles are entangled without creating the system yourself and without measuring them since any interaction would ruin the connection? Um, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure you could know. I mean, if someone just hands you two particles and you're not allowed to do any measurements, then I, I don't think you can tell if they're entangled or not. I'm not 100% sure though. So the question is, how is entanglement observed in research? So you can do uh, lots of different things with entanglement. One of the things, for example, is quantum computing. You can use the fact that bits are entangled with each other to do calculations in a way that is much faster than the classical computer. You can do quantum teleportation where you take a quantum state and basically teleport it to someone else. You can do quantum cryptography, which I will explain about later. So all of those things depend on entanglement. So you create entangled pearls using some kind of process like I described before. For example, the angular momentum has to be conserved. So if you start with zero, you get opposite angular momentums for both the particles you created and therefore they are entangled. And once you do that, you can then do all of these applications that I mentioned, or you can do all kinds of different experiments and verify that indeed the, the predictions of quantum mechanics and depend on entanglement are in fact what you measure in the experiment. So that's how we know that entanglement is a real thing because we use it all the time in, in experiments and applications. Um, so there's a question, what is the mechanism behind quantum entanglement? What is the reason for correlation? I'm afraid for that you will have to wait until we study the math. So in about two weeks from today, I will probably talk about quantum entanglement when you then will have all the necessary mathematical background and you will understand exactly what it all means. So the question is, how will homework work? Do we submit via Quirkus? Um, yes, you can submit them. So I will uh, write solutions to the homeworks and I'll post them on the website. And as soon as the solution is posted, you can't submit your own solutions. So generally, I think I'll give you about two weeks to do each homework assignment. And you submit them via Quirkus. So if for some reason that doesn't work, you can email them to your TA. Okay, well, I'm glad all of you are really participating very nicely and asking me very good questions. So please keep doing that. I don't think it's gonna be a hard course, but it's gonna be conceptually hard to grasp what we're gonna talk about. So it's important that if you don't understand something, don't be shy to ask a question. By the way, you can even send me a private question if you don't want other people to know that you asked a question. On the chat, you can select to send the question just to me if you want. And uh, yeah, so please keep participating in the lectures and also the tutorials. Next up today are tutorials that start in three minutes. So good, so you have the details for the Zoom meetings for both of the TAs.
just connect to the one for your TA and uh, you, the TAs will teach you about complex numbers. So pay careful attention because complex numbers are extremely important in quantum mechanics. Everything in quantum mechanics is based on complex numbers. So pay attention and we're gonna meet back here in this Zoom meeting on uh, Wednesday in the usual time, is usual meeting ID, usual password, and I'm gonna start te teaching you about linear algebra, and uh, that's what we're gonna talk about for the next few lectures. Um, so if there's not any more questions, I will say goodbye to all of you.